So now we turn to chapter 4, which is a very different story from the previous three chapters, because in this one, we have actually Nebuchadnezzar himself uh, speaking. Uh, he's telling the story, that is to say. So King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages, you see, he's speaking. And look at verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease. So the whole of chapter 4 is actually an account written by Nebuchadnezzar. The entire story is in his own first-person singular voice telling us about his experiences, okay? So that's something different about uh, chapter 4's dream. And of course, as he sees this dream, he is, um, he is going to call in Daniel, and he's not going to hide the dream from Daniel like he did in chapter 2. He now trusts Daniel, and he's intrigued and concerned about what the, what the vision shows. And interestingly, at the end of the dream, once he tells Daniel, Daniel himself, it says, uh, was dismayed for a while. He was dismayed by what he saw in the dream on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar. That is to say that Daniel and his relationship with Nebuchadnezzar, it proves to be meaningful to him what the vision is going to uh, declare. All right. Now, the question that we asked for this particular video is, uh, what is a tree? And how is it different from these statues in the other uh, chapters in chapters two and three, because a tree is a big old colossus thing that reaches up into the air like these big statues did, but obviously it's very different. And the most obvious thing that makes it different, well, better yet, let's not, let's just look at what it says that makes it different. First of all, it's strong. When you see trees, you know, blowing in a storm, it's, it's amazing the stability in these things. It's nothing like the statues that man builds. The stat, the, they're, they have a, a kind of innate natural strength in, uh, in them. And then there's a beauty. Verse 12 speaks of the leaves being beautiful, which means that um, we like to look at trees, right? If you, uh, if you uh, see a forest of trees up on, up on the, say, in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains or the Rocky Mountains, you, you enjoy looking at the tree line. All right, it's pleasant to your eye. Now, how does that compare to a bunch of statues? So just take the buildings, not even statues, you know, that, that uh, fill the horizon of, of Manhattan. And you look across the Hudson River and see the skyline of Manhattan. Would you rather look at the skyline or would you rather look at a tree line? Right? The beauty of the trees is so much greater and superior to that of what is just built in terms of whether it's statues or buildings. And then, of course, a tree can provide food, right? The statues couldn't provide food. You can live off of the food that's provided by a tree. A tree is of massively much greater benefit to humanity than a giant statue. Uh, and there's shade. Imagine what that would mean in the desert of Babylon, to be able to have a big old tree, you could find some shade. The animals would seek the shade as well. Uh, and of course, birds lived in its very branches. It provided a home and so on for the beasts of the, of the, of the air and even some of the field in its trunk and, and uh, such. So all this is to say these are this is a radically different image from a statue, right? And most importantly of all, I suppose, is the idea that the tree itself is a living thing, right? Statues are dead. They're sterile. A tree is, is actually living. And why might that be uh, so important? Well, because a tree then is not built by humanity, right? Humans can build statues and skyscrapers and rockets to go to the, the moon or to go to Mars, perhaps. But we can't build a tree. A tree is a living thing. No human could create it. If you see a tree, it's a gift from God. If you see a little sprout of grain sticking up out of the ground in a field, that is a gift from God. Because that grain came from other grain, which came from other grain, which came from other grain. The only way grain comes about is from other grain. Well, there had to be a first grain. 
and that came from God, according to Genesis. God the Creator. This is why Jesus said that when we are um, when we pray to God, we should ask Him for our bread. Give us each day our bread, our daily bread, the necessary bread we need, because bread is literally from God. When when the Israelites ate the manna that came down from heaven, that was just a more obvious indicator that all bread comes from God ultimately. So this tree, of course, is going to depict Babylon, and in particular its head, Nebuchadnezzar, over the city of Babylon. And this is a fascinating image of the city of Babylon. It's not this sterile, impressive, giant statue but it's a living, breathing thing that provides beauty and shelter and food in the desert, in what otherwise would be a much harder life. Babylon, you know, had its famous suspended gardens, its hanging gardens. It would have been wonderful to walk around and underneath these gardens. So uh, all this is to say that this is how God is depicting Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. It's a very favorable critique. Um, now, the question is, uh, what does this communicate to, to Nebuchadnezzar? Because as you know, at the end of the dream, we read that the tree is chopped down, but the stump is left. Now, you know why that's important. Because a stump, if you leave a stump, what's going to happen? And because you know what would happen, I'll tell you if you don't know, I'll tell you in the next video, but... Uh, it had to be bound with a band of iron in bronze. Why was that done? So what is all this communicating to Nebuchadnezzar about his rule over the city of Babylon? So best wishes, and we'll see you next time.